if you're new or visiting, we're going through 1 Corinthians verse by verse. We'll see how far we get today. We actually did start in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, 1. And here we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. I've been encouraging you over the last two months to read chapters 12, 13, and 14 together weekly. I hope that you've been doing that because this is focusing on the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes people say, you know what, when are we going to do a study about the Holy Spirit? Well, if you've been coming here for any time, we talk about the Holy Spirit almost every single week. But this is specifically in 12, 13, and 14, focusing on the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the triunity of the Godhead. And so this morning, let's read over our text, and again, we'll see how far we get. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men or to mankind. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, If I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach also others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Father, again, we thank you for this time of worship. Steady our minds. Help us to focus on your word this morning. These are just a few moments as we march towards eternity where we can get to know you better. Little by little, inch by inch, to become more like your son Jesus through the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray for the gift of teaching in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, as we move into chapter 14, the Holy Spirit really zeroes in on how the gifts should be used in what we call here at Calvary an afterglow service. We don't believe that this this should be practiced on a Sunday morning, although we're going to do it on one Sunday morning so that you all can experience. But on regularly, we don't encourage this because we believe that the Holy Spirit would not interrupt himself. 
And as we're teaching the word of God, I only have 30 to 40 minutes to disciple you, as the word says. A pastor is to build up the sheep for the work of the ministry. Not just the ministry here on Sunday or Wednesday or any other day, but the work of the ministry as you go out into your field. Because the harvest is ripe. Even as we read this past week, but Jesus said, pray that God would raise up harvesters. And so you are a part of that process, hopefully. If not, you need to step up and become a part because you're an ambassador for Christ. You're an ambassador for Christ. I cannot come to your workplace and probably the rest of this church can't either. So you're there, you're stuck there for a very important reason. There's people that need Jesus. There's people that need Jesus and they need to see a living example of what a Christian is. Because they hear a lot of stuff about Christianity. You are a walking epistle. So be the best that you can be. You're going to fail. You're going to make mistakes. I did. I still do. You apologize. You brush yourself off. Ask for more of the Holy Spirit and keep moving on. So we had a flow of chapter 13, and most of you probably know, but for those who don't, uh, the Bible, the, the letters were not written in, in chapter and verse. That was added hundreds of years later for our convenience. So it was just one letter, one scroll. So Paul here, the flow continues, pursue love, pursue love. And if you weren't here, you can get the tape. But last week we taught, the chapter 13 taught us about the true meaning of love. And that's what Paul continues with here. Pursue after agape love. Not phileo, although that's nice. Not uh, storge, although that's wonderful. And, and not eros, that's fantastic in the marriage situation. But agape, unconditional, selfless, committed love. It's a love that is others orientated. It's a love that says, it's not about me and what I want to do. So as we're focusing on this process and on this afterglow setting that we're actually going to do on a Sunday morning, you want to remember this. It's not about you. And as we go into asking God to give us the word and maybe a specific verse, it's not about your favorite verse. And raising your hand and saying, oh, I just got to share my favorite verse. It's not about that. When you go into an afterglow service, it's waiting upon God to give you a verse or a few verses and, and waiting and praying and waiting and praying and your heart's gonna be pounding and you're gonna be saying, no, God, no, God, you don't want me to share this. No, you don't, no, you don't. Yes, he does, but just be patient and you'll see how it will flow. Um, one time as, as I was at one of these at, at my previous church and the Lord gave me a verse, it, it meant nothing to me, absolutely nothing. And I'm like, what is this? And so um, as time was going on, the evening was going, I was just praying and saying, God, do you really want to share this? And the Holy Spirit kept telling me, yes, share it. Yes, share it. And so at appropriate time, I stood up. I was recognized. I read it. I didn't interpret. I didn't say anything else. I just read it and I sat back down. And that's basically what we do. You just share what God's put on your heart. You don't have to necessarily explain it. Maybe, maybe the Lord will have you do that, but most of the time it's not. It's just the Lord's giving me this verse. Nothing happened. You know, not, nothing happened. The sky didn't fall. People didn't get up and clap. Nothing. But after it was all said and done, the evening was all said and done, there was a man that came beelining right towards me. I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> I mean, he was on a mission. He didn't stop or say hello to anybody. He was just on a mission. And he came right over to me and he said, thank you for sharing that verse. Because before we came here, we had to make a decision. And we said to God, God, if you give us this verse, then we know what we need to do. And God gave them that exact verse. That's what an afterglow is all about. Just waiting upon God. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about God working through you and me through a humble spirit. And if God doesn't give you something, that's okay. That's okay. I don't speak out at everyone. That's okay. But watch what God does in our midst. It's, it's unbelievable. So pursue love. It means to seek after eagerly, earnestly endeavor to acquire. You know, when Claudia and I were, we first met, uh, we met at a religious class. We were born and raised Catholics. And so we were going to uh, school, Coronado and, and Scottsdale. We'd never met each other before. And our parents said, you're going to go to religious education because you don't go to a Catholic school. And so um, we were both 17 at that time. We said, all right, whatever. 
And so we went to class and we saw each other in the, in the, in the bigger setting. And they said, okay, what we're going to do tonight, we have a special thing going on for seniors. And we were both seniors at the time. And we're going to have a class where a marital couple and a priest is going to be talking about marriage. They're going to do a series on marriage. So all of you seniors, you go into this room over here and you're going to have a class on marriage. And that's where we first saw each other. We didn't necessarily meet, but that's where we first saw each other. She was beautiful then, still beautiful now. Her hair went down to the bottom of her back. Uh, just beautiful. I thought, whoa, I got to meet this gal. And, uh, and we did. And our first date was uh, our first outing, not really a date, was February 12th of 78. And our first official date was Valentine's Day. And this Valentine's Day will be our 45th Valentine. And so... When we started dating, I would give her a carnation every month of, on the 14th. I gave her one carnation. And then the next month, I gave her two carnations because we, we dated two months. And the next month, I gave her three carnations. And then the next month, four carnations. You get the idea. And then on one year anniversary, I gave her a rose and one carnation. And I was talking to her last night, and she said, I think it stopped after that. <laughs> but I was pursuing her. And uh, she went to the phone book. Any of you remember what phone books were? Those paper things? Yeah. She went to the phone book. Today, this they would call this stalking. But she went to the phone book, looked up my parents' name, called the house. My mom answered. I was talking to her last night. That's why I know this. I, and she said, I hung up. And she said, if it was you, I probably would have hung up too. But she found my address and she drove by my house. I think that's stalking. I don't know. <laughs> But then she was doing things. And so we were pursuing each other. And any of you who have dated, you know what I'm talking about. Well, this is agape love, not phileo love. Agape love. Pursue after committed, selfless, unconditional love. Because I'm, I know in our early years, it was not agape love. It was not agape love. I know that for a fact. We won't get into that, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. You have to learn what agape love really is by first knowing how much God agape is you. Just like anything, you want to forgive somebody? Learn how much you've been forgiven. You want to get rid of anger? Realize that God's not angry with you. You got bitterness in your heart? Just God bitter towards you? You take all those principles and you equate it in the, in the vertical, then you can live it in the horizontal. You first got to realize you're wicked. I have a desperately wicked heart, the Bible tells me. You do too. Just don't look at me. You have one. It's in the Bible. So you have to allow the Holy Spirit to transform that. And you do that by pursuing. Notice what Paul says. Pursue love. Before he gets into the order of the, the service. You guys seeing the bigger picture? Pursue love. So Paul says to follow after that type of mentality. A mentality of being more like Jesus. And why would Paul stress this as he starts to outline the order of an afterglow service? Well, let's, I, let's look at verse 12 real quick. Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts. Notice they were zealous. That word zealous means a burning desire for what is good, fervent in spirit. A burning desire for what is good. So you have a zealous for your football team. And the playoffs are coming on and they lose. Are you still zealous for your team or are you yelling at the TV? See, that's phileo. If you win, I like you. If you don't, you're a bunch of idiots. No, this is, this is agape. But notice here, even so, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, you have a desire for them. You're pursuing them. You have a love, but it's not agape love because you're stepping on each other. You're trying to do, it's about me, it's about me, it's about me. No, that's not agape love. Not at all. Let it be for the edification of, Notice what it says here, the edification of the church. Not for you. Not for people to look at you and build you up, come after their service. Wow, that was incredible what you just did. You've got a gift. Wow. Oh, well, thank you. I, I know that. No, I mean, I, oh, just thank you. <laughs> that you seek to excel. How about verse 26, which we won't get to today? How is it then, brethren... Whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm. Notice this here. When you come together. So they were coming for specific afterglow service, which is different than a typical Sunday morning service or a Wednesday night service. So there was going to be an afterglow service. They were praying. 
they were going, God, I'm zealous. I want to be used of you. I want to bring something to the church. I want to bring something to the body. Are you guys hearing this? This this isn't a, well, I got to go to church this morning. I got to fulfill my religious obligation. Well, you know what? This sermon was kind of okay, but you know, if he would have said this, or if the music would have been like that, really? Is that what you're coming for? I hope not. But as a whole, that's typically what a lot of people do. And when they don't like something, then they find another church that'll satisfy their flesh. Music isn't as loud. Oh, they sing hymns here. Oh, they do this or they do that. Oh, the chairs are so comfy. That happened one time here. Somebody was visiting and they said, oh, your chairs look so wonderful. I said, oh, they're so comfortable. I knew right after that, this lady isn't going to last a week. (laughs) Never saw her again. Because my message wasn't comfortable, but the chairs are. (laughs) Each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue. Look what's going on in verse 26 here. They're zealous. They're seeking after. We want to be used of God. Some, I'm sure, had selfish motives. Others had pure motives. So not all of them had selfish motives, but some did. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit wouldn't have given this information to us. Has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. What does Paul say through the Holy Spirit? Let all things be done for self-edification. Is that what your Bible says? For edification. And as we go through the chapter, church edification, the building up of the church. So as you guys are going through this, I pray that you would be praying, not just for an afterglow, but even before you come to church, God, how do you want to use me today? Is there somebody that needs a hug? Is there somebody that needs a handshake? Is there somebody new and I haven't met them and I need to just go over and purposely, purposely, even though I'm uncomfortable, I'm going to purposely say hello to them. God, you put that on my heart when I walk in that room, who I need to go over to. Who might need just a word of encouragement? God, just give me a verse. If you want me to encourage somebody, God, give me one verse. And when I go in, show me who needs that verse. Guys, that's what we should be doing. Not just coming for a comfortable teaching to get fed so that we can get fat and be fat Christians spiritually. No, we need to be honed. Iron sharpens iron. We need to be ready to move in this country that we're in right now that is going down the toilet fast. We need to be ready to bless one another and encourage each other. So we can see that these Christians at Corinth had a burning desire for the gifts. I think if just reading those verses, I think you would agree with that. They had a burning desire for the gifts. They weren't sitting around just waiting for another Bible study from Paul. They wanted to participate. But they were using those gifts at the expense of others. You'll see why. This is not true spiritual love, but a carnal or what's termed in Christianity a fleshly action, most likely motivated by selfish desires. So this verse shows us that we need to follow after the example of Christ's love and continue to seek, continue to seek after spiritual matters or gifts. Even when we're done with 1 Corinthians, don't stop seeking after the gifts. Don't stop seeking after what God wants to use, how God wants to use you. Again, a clue is given to us here about the condition of the church at Corinth. You see, Paul lets us know that prophecy or foretelling of the word is far more important. More important than what? As you go over this chapter, you're going to see than speaking in tongues. As we're going to see in this chapter, the gift of tongues had become a fleshly issue that was dividing the church. Could spiritual gifts divide the church? You're reading it. If you're reading, if you haven't, read it. Spiritual gifts can divide a church. You're seeing it in real time. It definitely wasn't edifying those who were gathered at the service. Verse 2, for he who speaks in a tongue, very important, does not speak to men or mankind, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Here we see that the gift of tongues is between God and a person as it is directed towards God. In general, it is not a gift that is directed towards another person. The gift of tongues, in general. 
Now we'll see later on that there might be a speaking out to the congregation with the gift of tongues, two, at the most, three. Very interesting as you read the scriptures. And there needs to be an interpretation that takes place or there's no more speaking out in tongues out loud to the flock. It's in the chapter. If you've been reading, you go, yes, that is. So this verse clearly shows us, and we'll see some more verses shortly, that we should be speaking to God using the gifts of tongue. I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation. It's on a slide here. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. Same verse, New Living Translation. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You'll be speaking by the power of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Notice capital S, the Holy Spirit. But it will be all mysterious, mysterious, mysterious. Verse 3, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. I believe prophecy in the New Testament is predominantly forth-telling, F-O-R-T-H, forth-telling of the Word of God. It is the good news of Jesus fulfilling the scriptures, thereby being the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. And here Paul tells us that the evidence of the gift of prophecy should be, the evidence of prophecy should be edification, exhortation, and comfort. Remember that in this chapter, Paul is addressing the issue of an afterglow service where unbelievers may be present. So it's important for us to see that when the Spirit moves us to prophesy during an afterglow service, the end result should be for edification, which is building up, exhortation, an encouraging word, a call to draw near to God, or comfort, calming or consoling. Now, we do have some examples of foretelling in the New Testament, but primarily it is forthtelling. Foretelling is the book of Revelation. There's going to be a seven-year tribulation. We at Calvary believe there's going to be a rapture. There's going to be a seven-year tribulation. There's going to be a thousand-year reign of Christ on this earth. And then there's going to be the final great white throne judgment and a new heaven and a new earth. It's in the book of Revelation. So that is foretelling. It hasn't happened yet, although many churches, even in our community, will say that all happened in 70 AD. The book of Revelation is allegorical. I'm like, wow. I missed that, set, that thousand year reign of Christ somewhere on this earth. We all missed it. It is what it is. So we at Calvary believe from Genesis to Revelation, the whole counsel of God. So we do have some examples of foretelling in the New Testament, but primarily, primarily prophecy. When you hear the word prophecy, it's the foretelling of the good news of salvation through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection at your workplace, on break, before work, after lunch, uh, at lunch, after work, not on work time. You're not paid to be an evangelist at your workplace. You're paid to do your job. Do your job. Be the best Christian, on, be the best worker and best employee on the job site. And then they might ask you, why, do you, why, why are you so on time? Why are you so diligent? Because I work for God. You just get the benefits. I work for God. They're watching you. And then you can talk about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. You can do all of that in less than a minute and explain to someone the good news. You are foretelling the gospel. You don't want to get into foretelling. Well, did you know there's going to be a seven-year tribulation? Right away, they've checked out. <laughs> They're like, you mean this isn't bad enough? This that two years? It's going to get worse? It's going to get way worse. Verse 4, he who speaks in a tongue, please notice, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself or herself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Here we see that the gift of tongues is for personal edification. And in my study, I see it as the only gift as such. It's the only personal gift. It is that communication we can have with God that only he knows and understands unless, as we just read, there is the gift of interpretation given to the one speaking to God. Where the fourth telling of the word of God can build up those who are present at the afterglow service. So that's why I find it very interesting. The Holy Spirit made it very specific in this chapter. If someone speaks out in tongue, 
various times, two at the most three. Very clear cut. And not everybody's speaking out at the exact same time. Above everybody else. No, no, if there's a gift of tongues, everyone is quiet, it's going to be totally obvious. One person is going to speak out. We wait for interpretation. If there is no interpretation, then there's no more speaking out in tongues. That's in this chapter. If there's an interpretation, praise God. Then we continue on with the service. If there's one more, praise God. If there's one more, okay, that's it. The Bible says two, three at most. It's in the Bible, guys. It's in the Bible. So we want to stay with the Bible. Verse 5, I wish you all spoke with tongues. What is he saying there? That some of them didn't. I wish you all spoke in tongues. But even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive what? Edification. I believe that Paul is making reference to the fact that they all didn't speak in tongues as we studied at the end of chapter 12. You can go back and look at it. You see, not everyone is going to receive the gift of tongues. It doesn't make you less of a Christian, less spirit-filled. Remember, we've already talked about this. God, the Holy Spirit, gives the gifts as he discerns, as he determines. So don't, don't take anything negative out of that. But everyone can hear the word of God and be edified, encouraged, or comforted through that word. Again, notice at the end of the verse that when they gathered, when they gathered that the gifts are about the whole body or church and not the individual member. So important. Now, that individual who shared the word might be edified, encouraged, or comforted, but it's not about the person who gave the word. It's just being obedient and sharing the word. You see, Paul is trying to bring maturity to this group of unbelievers by getting their eyes off of themselves. And that's what I hope to do as well. Because I know you you all did not come out of Calvary chapels. Um, There's all kinds of different denominations that could be represented here that you came out of. And so you have a program running in your mind right now, even as I'm going over these, these chapters of, well, that's not the way we did it when I was growing up. Well, that's not the way I was taught. Well, that's not the way I believe. And that That's fine. But please take for what the Bible is saying. And if I'm misinterpreting it, please come with scriptures. I'm not saying I got it all together. I'll listen. Holy Spirit can minister to me as well as to you. But if you're seeing it the way it's read, just the way it's written, then participate. And if you don't, it's you that is missing out. We all need to mature. I, at 61 years old, I need to still mature in areas of my life. If you're still breathing, you need to mature. You need to mature. So when you take your last breath, we'll all proclaim, he's dead! Praise God, another sinner is dead! Till then, we're saints trying to work out our salvation, right? Verse six, but now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophecy, or by teaching? If no one understands what I'm saying, what good is the tongue, Paul is saying. Verse 7, even things without life. So now he goes into a practical example, a physical analogy to teach a spiritual principle. Even things without life, whether flute or harp, whether they, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? So very basic, very simple. We have instruments up here. If everybody just gets up and just does their own thing, Chaos is going to assume. Uh, You guys have heard the analogy of a symphony. Even the tuba has a role. All by itself, not very good. But at the right time, wow, it adds. So this is what Paul is saying. Even lifeless instruments have a purpose. And then in verse 8, I think he's referencing the Old Testament, the call to battle or the call to worship. For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So even the trumpet in the Old Testament, there was very specific sounds for gathering for battle. And there were other sounds or rhythms for the gathering of worship. So a guy just didn't get up there and play his own thing. No, he had to learn. And then he exercised that gift for very specific reasons. 
So you likewise, here's the spiritual principle from the physical analogy. So you likewise, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of tongues, uh, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. You see, when we go to another country, I've had the privilege of going to various countries, and they can sing a very familiar song. But I do not understand their language, so it makes it very hard to follow along. I'm not pronouncing the words they're pronouncing, so I try to pronounce it in English, and it just sounds terrible. So I sing very low, (laughs) just very, very low. Nobody really even hears me, but I'm trying to follow. And when they share the word with the flock, unless I know the language, I can't understand what they're saying, whether it's Arabic or Spanish or Hebrew, whatever it might be. I don't have a clue what they're saying. I can't even find out, well, they say turn to 1 Timothy. I, I, where, where is he? I, I, I don't even know what book of the Bible he's in. I don't know the language, so there's no benefit. So in a sense, I'm a foreigner, or in the King James, a barbarian, one who speaks a foreign language of which I cannot understand to them and, and me, they to me. It's that simple. Verse 12, even so, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you may seek to excel. So since that, in that case, with the natural man, don't seek to speak out in tongues in a group setting, but rather seek to build up someone with the word of God. Now, when someone interprets what is being shared in that foreign tongue, then I'm edified or encouraged. What took place? It's the translator It's the translator that made the tongue meaningful. And it's the Holy Spirit who makes the word of God come alive in my heart, making that word so impactful. It's the Holy Spirit. Verse 13. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. If you have the gift of tongues, and I encourage you with this, because I have heard testimonies of people who had the gift of tongues, And because they hadn't received an interpretation, they stopped using it for decades. I speak in tongues. I've spoken in tongues since 78. I have no idea what I'm saying. God has not given me the gift of interpretation. It's okay. I don't need it. I'm just going to do what God tells me to do. It's not going to benefit anyone in the church if there is no interpretation. Verse 14, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. You see why I do it? Even though I don't have the interpretation? For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Even Paul's saying, sometimes I don't know what I'm praying. What is the conclusion then? I will. Notice what is being said here. I will. I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. You see, what's going on here is supernatural. And I don't know understand how it works, but it's here in the Word. And so that's why I do it. You know, I really don't understand how electricity works. Please don't come up and try to explain it to me. I've had that done, I've studied it, I just don't get it. That's okay, you get it, praise God. But I enjoy its benefits every day. See, without electricity, my alarm clock doesn't go off. Without electricity, the bathroom lights don't come on and the toothbrush doesn't work. The coffee pot, the toaster, the oven, they're all useless to me. Many of you might be shaking right now, no coffee, no coffee. The email will not be received nor sent. My cell phone is dead, unusable. The garage door will not open. The car will not start. So even though I do not understand exactly how electricity works, I'm very thankful that I have the ability to use it. My inner man rejoices over the simplicities at times, but yet my understanding of electricity is still the same. I just don't get it. 
So what am I going to do? I'm going to do what Paul says. I will. I will pray in the Spirit. But I will pray with understanding. I will sing in the Spirit. But I'll sing with understanding. It's very, very interesting. Again, even though I don't understand electricity, I'm not going to stop using it. And Paul says, not at all. Paul presses on his use of both the gift of tongues as well as sharing the word in a natural language. He uses both and allows God to take care of the understanding aspect. He's not only relying upon what man thinks, but what God has to offer. Again, as I mentioned, notice that Paul says, I will. And then he speaks of the natural tongue as well as the supernatural tongue. And I see in this verse that there is a control involved in this verse. There's control. Paul has the ability to do both, but he is choosing to do one over the other depending upon the circumstance or situation. And we will see this confirmed in our next verse. But before we move on, I would like to point out that area of control. Some will say that when the Holy Spirit moves them, that they have no control over what might happen. Here we see just the opposite to be true. Matter of fact, we see throughout the scriptures that when people were moved by the Spirit of God, they had control and acted accordingly. Even when our Lord created a whip to cleanse the temple, not once, but twice. Three gospels only mention once. The gospel of John mentions at the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry, he cleansed the temple. He did it with control. It wasn't an outward show to draw attention to himself, but rather to point people back to the reason for the temple. So an afterglow is not to draw attention to me, but a reason why we gather, because the Holy Spirit wants to move amongst us with the gifts, so that the Jew and Gentile alike could come to learn about God and his ways. And we're going to have to wrap it up with that as the music team comes up, because it's 1030, so... Make a note, we'll come back to verse 16. Please read on the rest of the chapter because we'll move forward through the chapter as well. And we'll get to some really interesting verses when we get over to verse 34. (laughs) Read ahead. See what you ladies think about that. Father, we thank you for the morning. We thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness. And Lord, we thank you for preparing our hearts. And Lord, we all need to mature keep maturing. We've reached a level of maturity as we see in Philippians 3, 12 through 16, but we need to press on. We need to keep moving forward. We need to keep growing. So Lord, continue to grow us as a flock, continue to grow us individually, continue to use us with one another. Lord, we pray for the Sunday school, those little children, Lord. We know the world is seeking after them. The homosexual community, they have it in print. They have it in writing. We're coming for your children. We're going to deceive them. That's a fact. And here in 2022, we can look at our culture and we can see it actually taking place. Teenagers, young teenagers, confused over their gender. The enemy is actively working in our school system, in the public theater, on social media, God, fill us with your Holy Spirit that we might do something to reach these little ones for Christ. Suicide is taking place amongst teenagers because they're confused over their gender. Lord, use us. How wicked. Yet the enemy does not care about being wicked. He is wicked. He doesn't care about the truth. There's no truth in him. He has come to deceive and then to steal, kill, and destroy. So Father, you've given us as ambassadors for Christ the light, that we might take the light to a dying world, that they might come into the light, that they might have that salt and be thirsty for the truth of the gospel. Lord, use us this week. And Lord, we ask your blessing upon the march this coming Saturday. Lord, stir our hearts to attend if we can. If not, that we remember to pray this whole week for the unborn and for those moms who get put into that situation of being pregnant, that they would make the right choice, adoption, giving birth and putting them for adoption or raising them themselves. You're with them. You love them. You'll care for them. You'll help them. Turn their eyes to you, Father. 
and help us to be a part of that process. In Jesus' precious name, amen, amen. God bless you.